Romans chapter 13, verse 1, we read, let everyone submit, some of your translations will say, be subject to the governing authorities. Since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted or established or appointed or ordained by God. So then the one who resists, some of you have rebels against the authority, is opposing God's command. And those who oppose it will bring judgment. I love the King James, damnation on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the one in authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore, you must submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. And for this reason, you pay taxes. Since the authorities are God's servants, continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone, taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, and honor to those you owe honor. Verse 8, do not owe anyone anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, and here he quotes from Exodus 20 or maybe Deuteronomy chapter 5, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment. And this is from Leviticus 19.18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Verse 11, besides this, since you know the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep, because now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, and the day is near, so let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk with decency, as in the daytime not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and promiscuity, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Most of this is uh, straightforward. It's simple it's easy to understand. There are a couple of parts, though, that we do need to spend some time on, which we will. First, though, we should do a quick review. And this is so that no one thinks that this is a list of rules that have to be obeyed in order to please God and go to heaven. All of Romans, chapter 1 through chapter 11, has been aimed at the uncontroversial truth that every human being is a sinner and will never be able to live up to the rules, even if the rules come from their own conscience. They still can't live up to them. Paul goes through painstaking detail to lay out the logical and legal arguments along with historical evidence showing that the only hope for humanity is faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ reunites any human being with God in loving, healthy, abiding relationship so that the righteousness of God, the ability to do right, is given to any human being with faith in Jesus. That's Romans up to this point. The action point after belief is in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where we read, I urge you, therefore, to offer your bodies 
as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And so the question that is being addressed here in chapter 13 is, after I have given my body to the Lord, and I recognize that I need my mind renewed in how to think about life, what is it that he wants me to do? How do I live life? How do I make decisions? Chapter 12 began by starting to say it's in the receiving of grace and in the manifesting of grace in various functions, and he lists those functions. It's letting grace flow in and through your life. Then he says, let love be without hypocrisy. We're to live lives based on grace and based on love. And then here in chapter 13, he basically says, We are to submit to the governing authorities, obey the law, pay taxes, pay tolls, pay customs, living according to the law behind all the human laws, which is the law of love. Treating one's neighbor the way that you would want to be treated. Recognizing that all of this is temporary. Jesus is coming soon. And that's what really counts. That's the way that the chapter ends. That's a summation of it. That's a synopsis of chapter 13. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple, but there are a couple of questions that arise through this chapter. One of them is in verse one. What does it mean to submit? Because he says, submit to the governing authorities. What does it mean to submit? The other one is also in verse 1. Every authority is instituted by God. There's no authority that exists that didn't come from God. Does that mean that Hitler was God's choice? That's a good question. In verse 4, we read, oh, oh, sorry, Verse 4, we read that the government official carries the sword. Does that mean that a Christian should never be a government official? Because they have to carry the sword. The last question is in verse 8 where Paul writes and he says, don't owe anyone anything. And the question is, should a Christian ever go into debt? Should a Christian ever take out a loan? Let's take the questions in reverse order. Let's start in verse eight. Paul writes, do not owe anyone anything. Does that mean that we shouldn't have a credit card? Not borrow money from a friend for the soda machine? Not buy a car on credit? Never take out a mortgage uh, for a house? There are some Christians, many Christians, that believe that, and it's based on that particular passage, this particular line. Do not owe anyone anything. I personally don't believe that. Uh, I have a mortgage on my house. The last car I bought, I bought it on credit. We paid it off, praise God, but uh, bought it on credit. I have an American Express card. I have a line of credit. I also... Jen and I, we bummed 12 bucks off Yasmin on Friday because she took my kids to chapters and they picked out a greeting card and my kids didn't bring any money with them and so Yasmin had to buy it and then I had to pay her back 24 hours later. I've already disobeyed this. (laughs) I don't believe that's what Paul's talking about here. Why? Two reasons. First, the context. It's not talking about the banking system or the financial system. It's talking about government and authority. Look with me, verse 6. Let's catch the context. Verse 6, he writes, For this reason you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants, continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those you owe taxes. Tolls to those you owe tolls. Respect to those you owe respect. Honor to those you owe honor. Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. Paul's not talking about the banking or financial system. He's talking about the government and authorities. He's talking about society. So that is the first reason. The second reason that I don't believe that that's what he's saying is the rest of the Bible. 
Proverbs goes over and over and over again to the young person trying to teach them to distinguish between wise loans and foolish debts. A lot of detail there. It's trying to help them understand what to borrow money on that appreciates versus borrowing money on something that depreciates, especially co-signing. Lots of detail in Proverbs about that. Not only that, Jesus himself talks about the financial system and the banking system, and he legitimizes it. You remember the parable of the unmerciful servant. And as he is scolding the unmerciful servant, he says to him, this is in Matthew chapter 25, verse 27, he says, you should have taken the money and given it to the banker so that at least I could have received interest from it. How is interest earned? It's only earned by loans. If Jesus did not legitimize it, he would not have mentioned it, would not have said it. It's part of how we do things. Now, that does not mean that you should make stupid loans or stupid debts. You need to be wise about these things. Not get in over your head. Good and godly Christians disagree on this particular point. I personally know Christians who have taken this position and it took them literally decades to save up to buy a house or to buy a car. In the meantime, life was very, very, very difficult for the mom and for the children. In fact, every one of the children did not follow their parents' example when it came to money. They engaged with the financial system. Um, I also know people that did not go to university because they could not pay for it in advance and believed that they should not apply for a student loan. Do not owe anyone anything. Paul is not talking about the banking or the financial system here. Doesn't mean that all loans are good. It just means that's not what he's describing. Next question, verse four. Should a Christian be a government official or be a government authority because the government carries the sword? The question is uh, around that. Almost all the scholars I read uh, pointed to Genesis chapter nine. Genesis chapter nine is where after the flood, God transfers the responsibility for capital punishment to mankind. And he requires an accounting of mankind for uh, murder. They all point to this connection saying that the sword in Romans chapter 13 is a euphemism for capital punishment. One writer said that the normal method of capital punishment in the Roman Empire at this time was beheading by the sword. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst criminals in the lowest classes. So when Paul says the sword here, his original readers would say, He's talking about capital punishment. Some Christians believe that Jesus taught what has been termed pacifism. Jesus, you know, famously said, turn the other cheek. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter pulled out his sword, Jesus spoke to him directly and he said, Peter, put away your sword. Don't you know those that live by the sword will die by the sword? And so some Christians, because of that, and because of what is written here about the sword with a government official, combined with the end of the chapter and the realization that Jesus is coming soon and he will establish the first good government in the entire world's history, they say a Christian should never be a soldier, Never be a police officer, never take the oath for government office, never be in charge of the government or any of those kinds of things because of the sword and the responsibility of the sword. Jesus said, turn the other cheek, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. A few years ago, this is, I'm gonna give you a very emotionally charged example. Uh, I got some feedback in the 9 a.m. that it wasn't good. Anyway, here's the example. A few years ago, uh, a friend of mine from Florida posted a video on why he believed 
it was biblical for a Christian to own an AR-15. That's an emotionally charged argument, especially in Canada. And so he posted this video and he gave all of his biblical arguments for it from the Old Testament, from the New Testament. I thought he did a great job. And so I did what lots of people do. I posted it on Facebook and got immediate feedback. (laughs) There was a pastor, local pastor here in Ottawa, who saw that post and he was on vacation. Saw the post and immediately engaged in the argument and said, no, 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 my brother. Never, never, never would a Christian ever own an AR-15. Never. Jesus said, put away the sword. Turn the other cheek. We're not to have those kinds of things. And we began to have a discussion over Facebook over a couple of days while he was on vacation. And thankfully, out of all the people that were watching this juicy conversation go down between these two local pastors in Ottawa, uh, thankfully, everybody kind of backed off the argument and let, let us kind of talk. And it went over a couple of days. The argument did not end at the temple when Jesus made the whip and cleared out the temple. It didn't end there. Which you would think it would, but it didn't. That one kind of got navigated. The argument ended when we went back to this particular scene in the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus says, Peter, put away your sword. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. The argument ended based on what Jesus said next. Do you know what he said next? I'll read it to you. This is Matthew chapter 26, verse 53. Do you think that I cannot call on my Father and he will provide me here and now with more than 12 legions of angels? You say, Andy, what do you mean? I told my friend, AR-15 He's got an angel army. If Jesus is our example and Jesus is who we are becoming, the work of the Holy Spirit is to make us like Jesus Christ. If he never gave up his angel army, he retained ownership of his angel army. In fact, his angel army was ready to swoop in like that. You can just see them all hanging out over heaven going, we're, we're watching uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, my son and I, and you just see Caesar like this, right? And all the monkeys are just ready to, they're ready to roll, right? They're waiting for the, like this, right? And you can just see all the angels in heaven going, now, right? He never gave it up. Here's the point. You cannot demonstrate gentleness unless there is the very real threat of not gentleness, (laughs) of force and of power. Otherwise, gentleness has no meaning at all if you're unarmed. There's a lot of thinking going on, and there's a lot of anger going my direction. I'll just say that. I understand that right now. Say, Andy, you're American. Get out. Anyway, I'm, you know, I, I understand that. But you gotta, think, you gotta think through some of these particular arguments. Am I saying that everybody should buy a gun? No. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that at all. Not at all. What I am saying is, is that we should not judge other Christians based on an argument that does not exist in the scriptures. It's not representative of Jesus Christ. Look again what Paul writes here in verse four. Look at what he says. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Did you notice that the government official is described as God's servant? Not once, twice. God's servant. Listen. I am very grateful for the many Christians that are involved in law enforcement and in government and in the military. Many of them are doing profound work to help the helpless, to defend the defenseless, to protect the vulnerable 
and the weak and to bring God's justice to perpetrators. They should be Christians. It's okay to be a government official. In fact, it's God's servant doubly as a Christian and to carry the sword. Next question, does verse one mean that when it says God has instituted every authority, all the authorities that exist are from God, does that mean that Hitler was God's choice? What if we were reading this morning in Beijing? Would we say that President Xi Jinping is God's choice in the government while They're clearing out the church and persecuting the pastors and the elders and the church attenders. Would we say that if we lived in North Korea and Kim Jong-un was our leader who was decimating the church, would we say that south of the border about Donald Trump and President-elect Joe Biden? Which one was God's choice? Did the ballots even matter? That is the question, isn't it? Paul. Uh, Listen, this question goes hand in hand with the other one, which is what does it look like to submit to the governing authority? What does that word mean? What does it look like to submit? These questions are interrelated. They're good questions. Paul does not address them in Romans chapter 13. He doesn't touch them. We have to remember, this is not meant to satisfy all our curiosity, It's just to say, as a believer in Jesus Christ and one who has offered his or her body to God as a living sacrifice and is looking for what to do, practically, it's just to say, don't be a person who is rebellious to the government. Be a person that lives under authority, a person that is moral, law-abiding, Operating under the higher law, the law of love, of treating one's neighbor the way you want to be treated. A person that has done away completely with the old life and is living consciously as a representative of Jesus Christ. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's basically what he's saying in Romans chapter 13. Practically speaking, we're to pay taxes, we're to be respectful, we're to drive under the speed limit, we're to cross at the crosswalks, we're not to jump on the back of the bus without paying. Christians, two weeks ago, a friend of mine stopped in at the upper room to say hi, and when they came in to the upper room, there was a handful of us there, and none of us, including me, was wearing a mask. A couple hours later, my email box went bing, and my friend sent me an email and basically said, Andy, you're not allowed to be a hypocrite. You cannot preach and teach that we're supposed to obey the speed limit and cross at the crosswalks and not jump into the back of the bus and then ignore this mask bylaw. You can't be a hypocrite. My friend knew, because we've had the conversation, that I personally did not, was not convinced that the masks were actually helping us. He knew that. And I was therefore a bit sloppy on the compliance for the mask bylaw. But they had a point. As a believer in Jesus, I'm called to submit to the governing authorities. That's what I should have been doing. But I did feel vindicated this past week because Dr. Tam and Dr. Etches both put out statements that said these masks really don't do anything. You need a three-ply mask. And I was like, see, I knew I was right. (laughs) By the way, uh, I did go back and reread the rules and the law and the the whole thing. And here's a couple things that I found interesting. Number one, you can remove your mask if you're 10 feet away and you're speaking like this. You can remove your mask. You can remove your mask if you're eating or drinking. I decided to start drinking a lot of coffee. (laughs) 
You can also remove your mask if uh, you're in a, uh, not in a public place, but in an office setting, you know, this kind of thing, and you're maintaining a six foot distance from everybody else in that particular office, you can temporarily remove your mask. You don't need to wear it in those kinds of situations. But if you get closer than six feet, you gotta put your mask back on. And you can remove your mask in a public place if there's someone present that's hard of hearing and they need to be able to lip read in order to be able to understand. We've also found that sometimes the voice is really muffled and so it's hard to understand what people are saying through the mask. And so you can temporarily remove your mask in order to be heard. This is the things that are in the bylaw. I wanted to read it so I knew what I was submitting to. Here's the thing though, guys. The mask thing is not really is not really a matter of conscience. You can make it a matter of conscience, but it's not really a matter of conscience. There are some issues that are a matter of conscience, and they are on the horizon, even here in Canada. And it is not unreasonable to think that in a very short time, we may end up in a situation like Daniel where obeying the authority puts us in a position where we're disobeying God's law. What does submission look like in that particular situation? Daniel is probably the most popular example. You remember the king was tricked into signing a law that said if you prayed to anybody except for the king for 30 days, you'd be thrown into a den of lions. Daniel read the law and he did the same thing he had already been doing for years, which was what? Over to the window, open it up, and begin to pray three times a day out loud. And his political enemies had hatched the whole plan, heard him, had him arrested, and had him thrown into the lion's den. Daniel is this example of submission to authority even though he disobeyed the authority. Why is that? Because he maintained submission even in disobedience. He never went into resentment. He never went into anger. He never went into rancor. He remained respectful to the king and resigned himself to whatever fate the Lord decided. This is a man who demonstrates what we're talking about. Giving his body over to the Lord as a living sacrifice. And in that regard, it does not matter how it worked out. Esther said the same thing. If I perish, I perish. Why? Because she was about to proactively disobey the king in the desire to be submissive. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Daniel survived the lion's den. Stephen was the first Christian martyr. Daniel is a great example of submission to authority, not just because of the lion's den and the resignation of his fate but also because he demonstrates active submission. What do you mean? It's a submission that is active. It's true. Submission to authority is being respectful to the authority, no doubt about that, but it is also not laying down like a doormat and waiting for whatever happens is gonna happen. Daniel chapter one, you remember the story? Daniel and his three friends were told that they were to eat from the king's table. Sounds exciting until you find out that the things that were on the table that they were required to eat were against God's law for them to eat, the Sinai covenant. Daniel was in a predicament. Most of us were in that situation. Well, we go all kinds of different ways. Some of us would just go, woohoo, let's eat, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Others of us would go, you're a rotten king and your food stinks and I'm never going to, you know, that's not what Daniel did, right? Daniel, he did something that's brilliant. It's active submission. He's trying to figure out what is it that the authority is trying to accomplish, and he decided it must be that they're trying to give us the best food they can possibly give us so that we can be the best looking and the healthiest and the smartest we could possibly be. And so he said, 
Let's do a test. He made an appeal. Let's do a test. You let us eat vegetables and water for a few weeks and then test us. See which ones are the most healthy, the most beautiful, the most smart. Just do a test. And the guy says, no problem, let's do it. I understand the goal you're trying to achieve. How about we do an alternative? That way I don't have to die. <laughs> and, he, and he went for it. And at the end of the couple of weeks, you guys know the story. They were healthier, better looking, and they're smarter than the counterparts. And so the guy said, well, listen, you guys can eat whatever you want to eat. That's active submission. Listen, because of that wise appeal, because of that active submission, because of trying to figure out what the authority, even the wicked authority, was trying to accomplish, Daniel not only preserved his life, but he became into a position that he could be used by God even up to this very minute. Active submission. Trying to discern the goals of the authority and making wise appeals is not just illustrated in Daniel. It's illustrated in Esther. It's illustrated in David. It's illustrated in Abigail. It's even illustrated in Naaman's servant. It's all through the Bible. Here's the thing. The Bible has many examples of of people in authority that were actually wicked. With Daniel, it was Nebuchadnezzar, Belteshazzar, Darius, and Cyrus. With David, it was King Saul. With Abigail, it was her husband Nabal. With Esther, it was Artaxerxes, one of the worst kings in Persian history. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 13. A couple of years later, he ends up being arrested and is before the Sanhedrin and they're questioning him. I think Paul would be a good example of submission. This is in Acts chapter 23, starting in verse one. You can read along with me if you want. Acts chapter 23, verse one. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin, this is the Jewish rulers of the day, and said, brothers, I've lived my life before God in all good conscience to this day. The high priest Ananias ordered those who were standing next to him to strike him in the mouth. Paul said to him, God's going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. You're sitting there judging me according to the law, and yet in violation of the law, you're ordering me to be struck. Paul's a little mouthy sometimes. Those standing nearby said, do you dare revile God's high priest? I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, replied Paul. For it's written, you must not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Did you see what happened there? Paul didn't realize that Ananias was the authority, and then he excuses himself. Listen, what Ananias did was wrong. It was against the law. But because of his position, not the person, but because of the position... Paul excuses himself. It does not matter if everybody else is doing what is wrong, including the person in authority. The Christian, the believer, continues to do what is right. He again quotes the law. Paul says, you must not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Here's the thing. There is a separation. There is a distinction between the person in authority and the position of authority. We are to treat the person differently because of their position. Now, like we've been talking about, that does not mean that you lay down and play dead. If you keep reading in Acts chapter 23, you'll see Paul switches tactics because they want to kill him. And he switches tactics on how to deal with it, but he's recognizing there's an authority in the room. He switches tactics. You should continue to read it. In fact, if this topic is interesting to you, let me challenge you to read through the entire New Testament and look at the interactions between authority that is wicked or corrupt or doing what is wrong or evil 
and the Christian or the believer that is under authority. Very, very interesting because there are many examples of it. It's very instructive. Do you remember when the Pharisees tried to stump Jesus with the question, Should it, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? You remember Jesus answered, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God's what is God's. He draws this distinction between the domain of God and the domain of Caesar. God's domain is greater, it encompasses Caesar's domain. And so Jesus says, you give to Caesar what is Caesar's because you yourself belong to God. Remember when uh, they asked Peter if his master paid the temple tax? Jesus came back into the house. Before he said anything, Jesus said, hey, Peter, what do you think? Who do people collect taxes from, their own children or from strangers? And Peter goes, strangers. And Jesus says, that's right. The sons are free. They don't have to pay this tax. But so we don't offend them. Drop your hook in the water. The first fish you pull out, in its mouth, there'll be a couple of coins. One for you, one for me to pay the tax. Because you belong to God, you pay the tax. Here's another one. David. David is an example of submission to the authority. 1 Samuel chapter 26 David has been anointed to be the king of Israel. The problem is, is he's currently hiding from the current king of Israel. King Saul is definitely trying to kill him. It is an abusive relationship. The authority is trying to harm and to kill the person under authority. If David stays close to Saul, if he stays in the house, so to speak, he's going to die. And so David has fled, and he's seeking shelter. Sadly, this is the predicament that countless women have gone through. They can relate to David. 1 Samuel chapter 26, David and Abishai are standing over a sleeping King Saul. And Abishai says to David, this is 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 8. Abishai's a bad hombre, man. He guy's, a, guy's a warrior. Abishai says, today God has delivered your enemy to you. Let me thrust the spear through him into the ground one time, I won't have to do it a second time. And David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. For who can lift a hand against the Lord's anointed and be innocent? And then look at his reasoning. Listen to his reasoning. David added, as the Lord lives, the Lord will certainly strike him down. Either his day will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. However, because of the Lord, I will never lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. Instead, take the spear, take the water jug, and let's get out of here. And as you continue to read the story, what happens? David gets out of there. He gets a safe distance away. He calls out to Saul, wakes him up, embarrasses his general Abner, and then basically mocks Abner in front of all the soldiers. And then David says, look, I still respect you as the king. I'm still submitted to you as the king of Israel. I'm not moving back home. <laughs> You're trying to kill me. But I'm not trying to take you out. He demonstrates submission to the authority even when he is disobeying the authority and removed from the authority. Do you see this? What happened? Well, a couple chapters later, Saul was killed in battle. And David was eventually crowned king of all Israel. But it was not by coercion. It was not by deception. It was not by manipulation. It was by a willing people that gave him the place of authority. Here's the lesson from David's life. We don't necessarily go seeking these positions of authority. You wait and let them come to you. You don't take them. 
as believers in Jesus Christ, who've offered our bodies as living sacrifices, we are urged to submit to the governing authorities, even wicked ones. We're to distinguish between the person and the position. And in Canada, we have this glorious privilege. We can elect our government officials. It's great. And when we don't like them, we can vote them out. It's great. We also have the privilege of making sure that the votes are counted, that our vote got counted, right? We have this privilege. We, we, have, we have the opportunity to be active in our own government. We should take advantage of that. That actually is part of submitting to the governing authorities. Submission is active. It's participatory. It tries to understand the goals of the authority and actually help achieve those in a good and godly way. Submission is to always be respectful, even when we can't obey. Submission doesn't mean that we have to stay and be harmed. Submission can still be demonstrated while on the run and hiding. We submit to Caesar because we're submitted to God. Some people have read this passage and they've said, you know, Paul wrote this because he was trying to be politically correct. He knew this letter was going into Rome. He knew Nero was next door. He's trying to get into good graces. And this is before Nero went nuts. You all know that Nero did go nuts. He burned the city down. He blamed Christians. And then he began to persecute Christians. He would take them alive. He would sew them up into animal skins. And he would throw them to packs of ferocious dogs. He would take them and dip them in pitch, tie them to a stake in the ground in his garden, light them up so they would be a human torch alive to light up his garden for a state-sponsored orgy. Their argument is that Paul would have never written this if that what was going on, and they're right. Paul did not write this while that was going on. Church history tells us that Paul was beheaded by Nero. After hearing the news, went everywhere. It was Peter. Got a scribe to help him. And he put a pen and ink to the parchment. And he wrote a letter. And he wrote it to everybody that was scattered all over the region because of the persecution. That letter is preserved for us as the book of 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, here's what we read. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. He goes on in the letter to say how it actually works. How in submitting to an unjust authority because of God brings grace into the situation and is a replay of what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. It's a fantastic letter. Does that mean that if we're in a situation where there's somebody that's an abusive person in authority that we have to sit there and take it? No. Let me just state very clearly I got, I, got a, I got a message last week. Somebody was touched inappropriately at their job. It was a sexual assault. And they said, I'm not sure if my employer is gonna handle this correctly. I was like, forget the employer, call the police. It's a crime. Report the crime. That's why these laws exist. You don't have to stay there and take that. No, report the crime. Let justice come. If you're in a situation where there's an abusive person, there are laws in this country because of that. This should not happen. You don't have to stay there. 
You can remain submissive in your attitude, but like David, you don't have to live there. You don't have to be there. We'll help you. Do you understand? You also have to understand that the Bible goes places that are not Canada. (laughs) And it goes places where there are no options, there are no laws, there is no help. And the Bible provides help and hope to that particular person. But in this society, man, praise God we live in Canada. This kind of stuff does not have to happen. Amen? Amen? All right. Bunch of can of worms from this. We may not have got all them back in the box, but we may not have put them all back in the box. There's lots of stuff to talk about here. Hopefully what I've done is in walking through some of these examples, I've given you a little bit broader understanding of this thing around submission, around authority, around some of the things that we see in this passage. We're to be law-abiding people. Amen? Driving under the speed limit, paying our taxes, crossing at the crosswalk, don't jump on the back of the bus, wearing the mask. (laughs) 